Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me for our chat this morning uh, on localization, localization parasite chat. Everybody became familiar now with the uh, with the channel. This is the channel dedicated to the localization industry professionals, and this is where we grab our coffee on Friday morning and uh, talk casually about our industry, what's good, what's not working well, what do we need to improve. And just to confide in one another and share it with the rest of the uh, rest of the world. I am happy and I'm glad and I'm honored to be joined this morning with Diego Criteri. And Diego, I guess, uh, don't need an introduction, but I will try to do an introduction for Diego and I'll let him fill the blanks. Uh, from my introduction, he's a very well-known individual. That's why I said it doesn't need an introduction. But Diego is a founder of Creative Words also creative, a co-founder and CEO of Creative AI, which part of the topic that we're going to be targeting today, and a president of ILIA as well, um, which is the European Language Industry Association. And I am the president of Canadian Language Industry Association. So great minds, things to like, and hopefully we've got some commonalities we can talk about today. And he's also the local lunch ambassador, which if you've known, if you've seen my video with Jan uh, Hendrich from before, um, you know, Jan, he's a co-founder or founder of, of Local Lunch as well. And uh, so we were trying to bring some um, the crossing path here and intersections between our conversation and our industry, which is global, composed of many thousands of organizations. But at the same, at the end of the day, we're not a big industry. We're smaller of an industry and people tend to know each other. And we have interesting stories. And that's what this channel is dedicated to, is to tell the stories of individuals, tell the stories of how did we get into the business, what draws us into the business, and where do we see this business going in the future? So welcome to the discussion, Diego. And Thank you very much. Uh, Honor to have you with me this morning and I look forward to further discussion. So if you don't mind, just to get us started, tell us a little bit about your story. How did you, <laughs> and I know you went to university, you studied translation, but what draw you draw you into it? I was really lucky, I have to say. So I loved languages. And when I was 14, I decided I wanted to study languages. The other option was like, do whatever, but not study. So I told my parents, either I study languages or I go find the work. And I was 14. And so I had an amazing English teacher uh, at, at high school. By the way, I was yesterday going back to my high school to give a presentation that was amazing. And so, and then I decided I want, well, the, fir the first reason why I chose that school is because they had, they were the only school in Italy, the only one uh, that had uh, trips abroad for students. So I really wanted to go abroad and I did. And after a couple of years, every school was going abroad with students, but that's another story. And then I decided I wanted to study translation because I was really in love with the English and with Latin as well. So I did want to do translation. I studied translation and interpreting. I'm actually an interpreter by studies. And then just before graduating, uh, I got a job. I got an internship in a company. That's where I landed in the industry. And I was completely shocked by how amazing the industry was. I mean, I never heard about localization. I never heard about what translation was about, honestly. So this is also why I do every kind of presentation at schools, universities, because I think the students, they need to know what, what is beyond university. And so that's why I'm here. I've been a translator for a couple of months. Then I heard about this project management role and I said, okay, Let's try it. I was in love with project management. I did that for three years. And then I became a partner in my former company. I stayed there for another eight years. And then I left and founded Creative Words. So how is it? Uh, tell me a little bit about Creative Words. Where, where are you located and how many employees? And I noticed like from the little bio that you shared with me that you're dedicated for uh, Italian companies who are uh, looking to, uh, to go global. And you're also helping companies who are from outside the, mar the market of Italy to get into the market of Italy. Uh, just a, a little bit of um, a vision. What drove you to open your own company, A? And B is where do you think 
you know, how do you define what you're doing right now in terms of, is it successful? What is the next phase? Well, that, that's a lot of questions altogether. Uh, I decided to open my company because of personal reasons, honestly. So it was really something I decided from one day to another. And so in 2016, I created Creative Words. We now have a team of 20 people, 21 including myself, which is pretty big in Italy. I mean, we are quite well positioned. My first idea is I wanted to become a single energy vendor, and this is where my bio, uh, this is what my bio is telling right now. Of course, with time, we've been growing and, you know, customers, they ask you whatever. And so they ask for another language, another service. And so we are growing in terms of services, in terms of languages, in terms of skills, many services, different services. Mm-hmm. Um, about the future, I'm, I'm questioning what, what will happen. I have no idea. Uh, you know, I guess we will uh, dive into that, but it's yes. a, a little bit of uncertainty at the moment. Yeah. And I would say also exciting times ahead. So a question for you, since you are in Italy and I'm located in Canada, I guess the question would be always to my colleagues from across the ocean, uh, how is the economy doing for you? How, how do you feel uh, things are progressing on a macro level uh, in, your, in your area, in Italy, in Europe, in the surrounding area? So I always, I, I never complain about the economy. I think we, we in the language industry are very lucky because we're very resilient and we don't really... You know, with COVID, with the war, there's always a need for communication and international communication and multilingual communication. So I think this we are doing pretty good. Uh, the economy is getting better after COVID, I think, in general. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for, I, we saw a slowdown in volumes in the last three months. And I guess every customer, every international customer is really waiting to see the potential of these new technologies that are coming out very quickly. <laughs> and so I, I guess this is the reason. Uh, I guess it's nothing to do with the macro economy. Uh, it's really because they're really waiting to see mm-hmm. what's next. I do tend to agree with you. I mean, our industry is, um, is I want to say, economic fluctuation resiliency built right into it. Uh, because I can just take an example of a customer, you know, um, that is impacted or a big company that are impacted by, by the economy, uh, economic dur- downturn, for instance, and they notice that perhaps uh, slow of revenue or, you know, slow down in revenue or sales. So the thing that they're probably going to be doing immediately is to try to do more communication to the market, you know, more advertisement, more marketing, more content has to be created to rectify that slow down in revenue. So that creates an opportunity for our industry. Absolutely. And when... And when the industry is, you know, when, when the economy is, you know, going in, in a positive manner, those organizations also needs to communicate the good news, the new product, the launches, uh, so on and so forth. So you're right. You, know, you I, invest I, in I, training I, as well. Yeah. <laughs> Do more training maybe when there is a slowdown. So, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, 100%. I, and this is what, you know, going back to what attracted me to the industry, that's part of it. Because... Uh, when I worked in the tech sector, you know, you, I got to a point where uh, we um, hardware from a hardware perspective, you know, you walk into a lab and, you know, they've got every gear and you end up with hardware saturation. You know, they've got a lot of hardware, but in a service environment such as this one, it's very uh, hard to get to a point where you've done everything, especially if you add the factor of content expiry. I feel like Every content that's been created has got a shelf life. Um, and, you know, if we don't look, I mean, as a consumer of content, if I don't look at things that they are immediate, that they're, you know, published in, an, in the past few days or a few weeks, I'm thinking in my mind, that's an old picture now. If, if I'm looking at an economic factor, if I'm looking at a, a status report, I need the new status report. And so um, when you add the factor of this content has a shelf life, a new content has to be created. And when a new content has to be created, of course, it needs to be translated. There, there you go. So that resiliency is right built into the, uh, into the, into the industry. Now, yep. when we talk about resiliency of the industry, we cannot ignore the fact of technology that's coming, uh, come, come across to us or coming along to either help us or depends on the, which side of the fence you are on. Some people think 
it is very helpful to the industry. Some people think that it's, you know, threatening to the industry. I think it's a combination of both and adaptation. It's the, it's, it's the key word here. So tell me a little bit. I mean, you've seen this industry uh, from, you know, back in the days of Logos, Stratos, and, you know, the variety of t- uh, transition memory system, transition management systems to where we are right now. So what have you noticed from the tools that you know and the new tools that they're coming online today? And where do you see the acceleration of innovation and how is that impacting us? So I, I let me say I was not there with Cap Tools when Cap Tools were launched. So they were already there when I joined oh, the industry. Okay. It was 2005. So I got used to it. I didn't go through the, the crisis, if you want, about Cap Tools. I was not there yet. Uh, but, well, the same uh, happened with machine translation. In 2017, somebody was saying that we, we were all going to disappear and it never happened. And there still are customers that uh, are now introducing machine translation post editing, like after six years. Uh, so I was talking with a customer last week and I mentioned one of the biggest and most famous systems, I, I guess I can say the DPL, and they had no clue what it was, like no clue. I think the difference here with Generative AI is that it's in Italy at least it's more popular, and by popular I mean that more people knows know about it. You would hear about generative AI in television on television. Mm-hmm. This didn't happen with uh, machine translation, so that that's the difference, in my opinion. And of course, it's much more accelerated. Mm-hmm. So I guess everybody have heard about it by now, but many people still don't know how to use it. So this is where we're focusing at the moment, right? Okay. Really understand the potential. And what do you think the, um, in your opinion, from the discussions that you've been having, what are the drivers for adoption of this technology? Is it cost savings? Is it more convenience? Um, is it, uh, you know, access? What is driving this? And what does the industry can do to either wrap their arms around this industry, and make a part of the solution versus you know, sit back and see what happens. I mean, I, I, nobody enjoys that. Nobody wants that. <laughs> but it's it's in some in some cases that happens. So, well, I would not. I would start by saying I would not sit back and watch and see what what's happening. I would really that's, that's the word. And be a, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we we need to to be there and do our own job, our own part in that. The sitting back and watching is not the right strategy. Um, I've been trying to be involved since the start. I mean, and by start, I mean when ChatGPT was uh, launched, generative AI was, GPT was there before, even before. Uh, so I tried to be there since the start. I think that's the right strategy and we all need to embrace it. I, uh, the drivers, I think it's a mix of cost saving and also a need for more communication. So we, we need to communicate more and more, and those tools can really help. Mm-hmm. Of course, there will be some kinds of content that will probably be just delegated to generative AI, but still there will be many, many contents that will need a human touch and human in the loop approach, I guess. So as technology evolves and, you know, we've seen so many technology come online and chat GPT is just the latest one and there are going to be more in the future, et cetera. Um, that, and I don't know, I mean, I'm just my, maybe my personal feeling that that quest, I would call it that journey that, you know, that um, exploration of perhaps one day translation becoming free. Where do you stand on that topic? Do you think translation will ever be free? I mean, it's it's a very controversial topic to be asked in any scenario. <laughs> just, I mean, I having coffee this morning. Nothing, uh, nothing going to be decided here. But what do you? Think? <laughs> well, if you mention the word the translation, maybe that's going to happen. If we talk more about content or communication or multilingual communication, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. When I talk with students, or when I talk with universities, when I'm involved in any kind of initiative or discussion, I think if we keep talking about just translation, I mean, it's obvious that translation will be probably 
lightly delegated to technology. Uh, if you have seen the OpenAI report on the jobs that are going, and likely to disappear anytime soon, translation is on top, right? It's the very first. I don't remember the percentage, but it's 70 something uh, likelihood of disappearing or being replaced by technology. But then we offer many other things in our industry, not just translation. We offer global experience, we offer user experience, we offer any other service. And I think it will take a, a long time before this disappears. But translation, if we think about manuals or, you know, they, they, they are being replaced by machine translation already, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that would disappear. But again, and, and this is also something I'm discussing on a European level in the commission. I mean, we don't really need to talk about translation anymore, even at university. I would not enroll my daughter in a translation course, honestly. <laughs> but I would enroll my daughter in anything having to do with international communication or globalization even or whatever, anything else than just translation. Translation is not appealing anymore, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's a know, word. And you know you have a very good, uh, very good topic when you talk about academia and academia's involvement in the, uh, in the industry uh, by, you know, by developing courses, degrees, and uh, preparing the next generation of translators to engage in the workforce. <laughs> Um, and I and I look at it and I'm thinking, you know, uh, I remember days when we used to go to, you know, not necessarily go to um, universities and try to encourage students. We've done that. Go to encourage students to get into the the the, uh, the profession of, of being a linguist. Uh, I remember, you know, going to uh, high schools and try to plant, you know, the idea at a high school level. And that didn't help, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, we may have converted like a handful of people, but we're not nothing to make a significant um, dent in what we need in terms of resources, in terms of workforce to join the localization industry. And it goes back into I've got a pile of work and that's the industry that we're in. We've got a pile of work that we need to do. We don't have enough people to do it. So what is the market saying? Well, I'm going to invent the tools. So yeah. when. And when we are not capable as an industry to do it, to do the work that the market or the global uh, community wants us to do, the global community, the need, the need is the mother of all inventions. So when you create the need and you don't have a solution, somebody's going to jump on making solutions for that. And, Absolutely. and I don't know if you've uh, caught the, uh, the news a few weeks ago when Slater published uh, the news. Uh, the news. I'm thinking about that. I don't know what they're going to say, but I think we yeah, are on the same page. YouTube guy, what's his name? Mr. Beast or whatever his name is. He, you know, he's doing, he's, you know, he's, he was using a translation agency or a localization agency. He got fed up with this. And he said, I'm doing my own thing. Uh, okay. This is the scary part, not the actual technology, the technology ability now for, from an open, uh, open source perspective. Anybody can go in and custom make their own solution. You're not using a ubiquitous platform anymore because the, the code, the technology is all available to you to build the blocks of a solution yep. that can allow you to do what you need to do. Yeah. And you brought up a very good point. I think, and I'm going to ask you this question, what's your view? I feel that the industry had a fork in the road right now. We either continue down the road of doing the same old, same old, or we have to reinvent ourselves as an industry. Can you comment on that? Yeah, of course, my answer will be we need to reinvent ourselves. I mean, again, many, many, top, many content types will just be delegated to multilingual generation. Mm -hmm. And we need to get on those on that train and, and do our part in that. Uh, when you mentioned YouTube, I was actually thinking about what you were saying about the need. And I, there, there was a strike in Italy, or there is maybe still a strike in Italy by dubbers like professional dubbers. Mm -hmm. And on one side, they are complaining about long working hours. There's a lot of volumes out there. They need to, long, to work long working hours. And on the other side, they feel threatened by, by AI, by synthetic voices. Mm -hmm. So where's the meeting point between the two? 
you complain, you have too much to work and you complain about someone looking for a solution to this. That's right. So it's, it's challenging. That's right. Again, um, I, the lack of a new generation entering the workforce, one would also, you know, talk about HR uh, issues and it's big HR dilemma in our business. You know, some of the, um, some of the uh, translators or linguists uh, or professionals, it doesn't matter if linguists or not, I mean, project managers, desktop publishers, et cetera. Those individuals either, you know, I mean, with all due respect, we all have to retire at some point. So they're probably aging at that point where we have a big bulk of, of uh, numbers of, of our professionals, they're going to go retire and the replacement is not ready. And it's not ready in the same numbers, I mean, but what we have now is technologies coming in and saying, okay, you've got a gap and I'm going to fill that gap. And here's the technology to, so, to solutionize it, to fill it for you. No, so one me. of the other issues is with walls. I mean, in Italy, we, the, we, almost, we always talk about translation and we, we train translators, but there are so many different walls in our industry. Mm -hmm. Again, it has to do with, with the need. We need project managers. We need different, different walls. And they never hear about it, about them, never. They're really not ready even to know what those are out there. Mm -hmm. It's not just linguists that we need, of course. Right. Of course. There's, there's many, uh, there are many uh, items or many professions in, 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 the, uh, in the language industry or in the localization industry that uh, are essential uh, for, our, uh, for, for, for the process. You know, um, one thing that you said very interesting and I'm very, it's still, uh, it's still striking with me is that you wouldn't recommend for somebody to go get a linguistic degree at this point where we are in the technology and how technology is evolving. Um, but there must be some other uh, technology related degree that would allow the industry to strive to. And which brings me to your, um, uh, in, in, I was reading your bio and you said, you would, you would hold workshops and seminars on innovation. Uh, what are some what what are what are some of the what are some of the um, innovations that you can tell our audience to? And, and we don't need to get into the detail or give any secret recipes here. But what are the high level innovations that you can tell our audience that probably they should consider? Can I go back to something you just mentioned? So I'm going to give a webinar to. The University of Gen a seminar to the University of Genoa on Monday, like in a couple of days. And I'm in their steering committee for the Faculty of Translation and Interpreting. So that's really actually where I studied. And they just told me that that very same, the very course is disappearing. So they're not teaching translation and interpreting anymore. It's just gone. <laughs> so I'm really shocked about it. Uh, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't teach translation and interpreting anymore. I think we need to have a more technological approach to it because otherwise we just, you know, they, they, they study a lot of English, a lot of second language. They don't know how to write in their own native language, for instance. So there are many things we should fix at the academia level, I guess. Uh, talking about innovations, what I'm thinking at the moment is that we really should learn how to interact with these generative AI systems. So call them prompt engineering, or I don't know, prompt engineering or would be the best word. Uh, so this is something I'm thinking of, but I don't expect academia to be aligned anytime soon. It will take probably decades uh, to, to align, but there are different courses already out there. Uh, and probably also what we see in our company is we are investing a lot of innovating the processes as well. So again, call them workflow engineers or language workflow engineers, uh, whatever you want to call them. It's, it's really someone with a deep understanding of language, but even uh, with also with technical knowledge, even programming knowledge. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion would be, go attended language school, a translation course, but then try and build your own technological uh, knowledge and skills. Is it far-fetched to think that 
chat GPT, for instance, can be used by translation companies, by localization companies as a tool in their process to make their job a little easier, faster, create more, um, more profit, perhaps some cost savings for them. Um, and I know- I, I think it's not far-fetched. Absolutely, it's not. This is something we are trying, starting doing. Uh, I don't think it's just a matter of cost saving. It would be too easy. It's like when six years ago, everybody was implementing machine translation. I think we need to build our own knowledge on how this technology works. Correct. And I guess in order for it to become an opportunity, we need to to make it work uh, to to I don't know to to increase our volumes, to reach more customers, mm-hmm. to be able to deliver more uh, work uh, than they we're doing now. Mm-hmm. So it's not really a matter of replacing the translators or the post editors or the proofreaders. Even trans creators is more a matter of offering different services. Offering different services. Yeah. So, so we just published our new, brand new AI assisted copywriting service page. Mm. So, but this is not a matter of, you know, as with machine translation, it's not a matter of uh, saving, uh, saving money. It's a matter of offering a service to someone who maybe wouldn't do copywriting if there was not such a hmm. cost-effective solution. So we know that, you know, um, some of these tools don't, don't address 100% of the market, right? So, um, you know, it will address obviously a chunk of the market. We don't know the determination of how big that market will be addressable by this particular technology uh, that we're talking about today. Uh, but what do you think of you know, the rest of the market probably, uh, and I'm thinking more like chat GPT, when it comes to chat, chat GPT, um, the security aspect, you know, some companies, some countries uh, don't allow it, maybe allow it. I don't know a certain aspect of that. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, details around the technology. And, and you bring a very valid point there, Diego, in terms of saying, let's learn how to fit this technology into each individual business. And our business is so... Uh, I want to say it is not a you know four square kind of a uh, kind of an industry well defined. It isn't because every customer's definition is different, every project is different, every tool that you use for a specific project is different. It's very you know from the surface you know you take a word from one language you put it into another language. Once you start peeling the layers, it becomes very complex. Yeah, correct. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there, there is there is some room for for additional services as well. I was talking yesterday with a customer of ours. They have an e-commerce and we do, we create other descriptions for them. And I suggested to the copywriter, to one of the copywriters, internal copywriter, that we move, we try, we, we build a case around, you know, using generative AI to, to, to create their own, their own other descriptions. And they said, no, absolutely. I, I, I cannot go to the owner of the company and talk about AI, they will just, you know, keep me out of the door. Um, so, and then there, there are infosec challenges with many companies and the bigger the companies, probably the more the challenges around uh, security, around privacy of data. So that there will be still a European commission, for instance, that there is a tender now uh, out there with many language combinations and the tender is for four years contract. And if if you go in that tender, if you if you uh, get that work for four years, you will only be able to provide traditional translation, for instance. Mm-hmm. And again, one of my biggest customer, big IT company, global one, they are doing machine transition right now. So it will really take a while. We have a little bit of time, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 You're right. And, you, and, and our expertise, you're right, you stated it earlier, may, it may morph into, transform into, you know, that whole engineering. We may go back into being technologists yeah. from, from, from being linguists. And, um, I mean, that's the driver. Uh, but com- combining the two, you know, have the, have, you know, going back to your initial um, uh, remark regarding academia, you know, if somebody has a linguistic degree or have some linguistic training or experience, 
and that morphs into a technologist that brings the knowledge with them to how do we tame, how do we train, uh, customize uh, these technologies to fit the linguistic world that we're living in or the localization world that we're living in. I mean, chat GPT, again, is the latest today. It's hot. Everybody's talking about it. It's not the last one, and it won't be the last one. I'm sure there'll be more. Absolutely. So. No, I think linguists are in the best position to, to be able to interact with these technologies. We know right. how to use the language, how to use the grammar, the syntax, how to fix issues. So we are really in the best position. Correct, correct. Now, what's your, uh, I, I know um, you, you're very involved in the localization world. So I'm going to ask you this question. So what's your read on, you know, some of the, uh, do, do you attend conferences? Do you go to like the gala? Do you go to Loc World? And what do you think of all this? Um, I, I personally, and, and I don't know why, maybe because I'm so busy and I didn't have a chance yet. I only attended one event. It was in 2006 and wow. it was Loc World in Montreal. And that's it. I never, I never attended anything else in terms of global sessions like this one. And, you know, we've got the local things. I'm a president of the local um, uh, uh, Canadian Language Industry Association. We're having our conference on uh, May 24th and 25th uh, in Montreal. And we're hey. offering a portion of it virtually. But um, if, if you're interested, uh, feel free to jump in. But what's your read on all this idea generating sort of a conferences that takes place? Around, around the globe in our industry? And do you have a preferred one that you'd like to attend? Well, I might be biased here because as a person of the year, we have four conferences during the year, different target audiences. That's okay to be biased, four. no problem. <laughs> so I started late in my career. Started My first one was Lockport 2015 in Berlin. I was invited by a customer. Sorry? You started with Lockworld as well? I started with Lockport, yeah. It was my very first one. I had no clue about conferences whatsoever. I was invited by a customer. I had the customer back then. They invited me to join them. They, they were having a panel and I did. I went and I never, I would never go back. So I attended so many conferences. <laughs> I spent all our money on conferences. And so I go to four conferences every year for uh, Elia and at least one a month one of Gala, either Gala or Lockwood. Next one from, well, I have two events in May and I'll be speaking at Lockwood. So after six years, well, no, six, eight years, I'll be speaking at Lockwood, which I'm very happy about. Um, but honestly, I think that's really important. For us, it was really important. We don't have any sales department. So all business we have is coming out of visibility or personal contacts that we build at conferences. So that, that's really a growth factor for us, I guess. And after, with Creative Words, uh, my first one was with Elia. And then what I'm doing now, and this is not something that's happening a lot with other fellow LSPs, is I'm not just going myself and sending my staff as well to conferences because it's really an opportunity for them to, to learn, to grow, and to make us more visible as well. So there are so many out there. Like <laughs> There are so many. There's a lot of competition. There, there is Lockwood, Gala, Mid-Central Europe, Alia, NTIF, uh, many of them. So we try to be there always, and we try to be like visible. If we can, we speak, we speak. We give presentations, and I think that's really helpful. Yeah. Now, I had a, um, a somebody on on the channel, which we um, we talked a little bit about uh, Alexandra, and we talked a little bit about uh, digital marketing and the importance of digital marketing in uh, the localization world. And the reason I say that is because um, most of our industry globally is formed of small to medium companies and you know csa i think put the number around eighteen thousand. i could be wrong on this one it's it's a huge number <laughs> it's a huge number so you know to promote yourself as a business owner as a company owner uh you need various tools at your hand and some people chooses you know the digital marketing side and i'm, and I'm no i know you're doing a lot of that which is kudos to you and you know attending attending a uh conferences etc and this channel is about this. This channel that I created yeah. is about promoting 
you know, some of those conversations that you guys are doing. And I'd love for you after you speak at Look World to perhaps come back to the channel and tell me how did it go, how, how it went. Yeah. A little, little brief summary here for the uh, for the audience. Um, it is, in your opinion, uh, you know, that soft marketing, I would say, I would call it, it, that's the style you're using, you know, being an authority in terms of thought leadership, this is very important for everything that we do. Of course, when you yeah. have many thought leaders, then you got to def- decipher which one is the better thought leader than the other. <laughs> so, so I think we yeah. get into that. Um, and, and you're successful at it. I mean, this is an example for the rest of the uh, uh, small to medium enterprise in, in our in our industry. I mean, you have 25 employees, you're working, you're successful, uh, things are going very well for you, and you don't have a sales team. That's That's pretty strange. It, it is strange. Look, I invested everything in marketing. When I was, uh, when I started Creative Words, my first hire, an intern, was on marketing. So it was me and the marketing person. Mm-hmm. So I started from there, never went back. I have a team of three now. I have a marketing manager, I have a graphic designer, and I have a I'm called social media manager or copywriter. They are the, the, the last two are interns at the moment but I'm looking forward to hire them. And I think it's really important. And uh, it's fun. <laughs> uh, it, it's some um, uh, inbound, right? It's what Upspot would call inbound. It's really about being visible and produce content that is useful for our, your audience and attract people, uh, customers. And yeah. this is how it works for us. And with a mix of conferences, useful content, case studies, a lot of talk, <laughs> uh, events, uh, and it's working. Uh, of course, you need a mix. I'm now looking into building our own sales department as well, mm-hmm. because that would be another boost, I mm-hmm. guess, to, to volumes sure. coming to us. But marketing is really important. And so it's you're right. I mean, you're right. I mean, in terms of where the revenue comes from, there's two channels, um, marketing or sales. Some companies decide to invest heavily in marketing. Some companies yeah. decide to... Uh, spend their money on sales teams. And yeah, for me, you know, it's more fun to, to, to do marketing rather than sales. I would probably save money on having a sales team, but with marketing, it's more fun. Oh, correct. But, you know, sometimes that hybrid model, sales and marketing, you know, if you prefer to continue heavy in marketing, which is fine, and then you have a one or two salespeople helping you, you know, moving it along, uh, it also helps quite a bit because... Let's face it, as your company grows, you're not going to be everywhere for everybody. You, you can't duplicate yourself. You need somebody to support you. You need somebody to help oh, you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. So my last question is, um, I, I noticed that you like skydiving. And tell me a little bit about your personal life. My personal life. Uh, so skydiving is the result of what we recently did with Creative words. We have this uh, short working week. So I'm married since 2010 and I have two kids. I couldn't find the time to have any hobby. So I had no hobby for the last 12 years. <laughs> uh, last October, in last October, we decided to have this short working week and I thought, okay, let's use this free time partially for the family, but partially for myself as well. Because otherwise it's just work and family, work and family all the time. And it's, it's, it's okay, but you know, you, you could wish for more, I guess. So I started with the license. I took this course on skydiving, which I completed a couple of weeks ago. So I know I can jump solo, which is great. I did that only once, but it was amazing. So yeah, that, that's probably my life. <laughs> Family, two kids, uh, I try to be there for the family as much as I can. And I, I'm successful in doing that, I guess. Well, you know, wives will, will always complain, but that, that's another story. But yeah, I can have my free time as well without feeling guilty. Uh, I'm not taking time off from the family, but you, you need that as well. Okay. Which, which part of Italy you live in? Uh, which, I live which... in Genoa. Oh, you live in Genoa. North okay. of Italy. Yeah. Oh, north of Italy. Okay. And so... Let me ask, you said you're married, you have two kids, and you do skydiving. And your wife let you do, do you skydiving, or did she have to ask you to maximize your life insurance? <laughs> <laughs> oh, usually uh, injury insurance 
doesn't go for skydiving. So oh my goodness. That's, that, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, no we that. have an adventurer in our mix here. Uh, <laughs> it's very, that. very safe. I have to tell you, it's very safe. It's not, it can look scary. It's really not. It's very, okay. if you are prepared, it's not really, it's really safe, honestly. Yeah. You know, you'd be, you'd be a very unique person in our industry, which is completely risk averse. Like our entire <laughs> you would never take risk. And here I'm talking to an entrepreneur who likes skydiving. I can't, I'm like, I'm shocked this morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm looking for, I'm probably going tomorrow, maybe, to, to do another couple of jumps. Very good for you. <laughs> I, I personally like, um, uh, just while we're sharing, um, I like uh, uh, photography. So I'm an avid photographer. And I love sailing. Um, I'm looking to, oh. uh, you know, I'm, I love, I love, you know, taking my, when I, I sold my sailboat a few years ago and I'm looking to buy a new one, but my wife and I were talking about maybe buying a sailboat in Europe, not in North America, because in North America, you only use it like part of the year and then you have to package it. Then you need to come to Genoa. <laughs> well, yeah, I heard, I heard maybe, maybe I should look you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come to Genoa. Any, yeah, any, but it's yeah. good to have your hobbies as well, right? Yeah. And passions out of, I mean, I'm passionate about what I do as a job, but, you know, you need something else, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, I mean, uh, we are driven, we volunteer, we talk, we spend 100% of our time in this industry. But as you said it earlier, you need a bit of an outlet of, of, cre of, of something that you enjoy doing that is not related to or connected to, to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I hope one of these days I learn how to skydive and do a tandem <laughs> with you because you sound like you know what you're doing and I wouldn't trust this with anybody else. So uh, any last word for our audience before we, um, before we uh, close up the interview? I have some last words for you. I was really happy to talk with you. I know we had the long overdue talk we should have <laughs> since the time I was uh, elected as in Alia and as president. So let's catch up on this, and now we can prepare it more. I guess uh, to the audience here is hopefully you liked it. Uh, get in touch if you have any questions, and follow your show, your I mean, Robin's show. Uh, very interesting. And to you again, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. And I want to thank you for taking the time this morning, Diego. Hopefully you come back and uh, chat with me one more time, uh, or okay. as many times as you like. Uh, the door is always open for you. And uh, absolute pleasure to have you on with me this morning. I really enjoyed our conversation. And when this is a video is all done, edited, the podcast is done, I'll share the information with you and the audience. And feel free to share, like, um, use it however you want to. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too.